The four different topics we'll discuss. New voter ID laws, the main reason why we're doing this, we're going through the counties, and we'll do it again uh, closer to the general election. Provisional ballot is connected directly to the voter ID laws, and therefore we're going to discuss that as well as it relates to voter ID laws. And then we'll talk about voter registration and uh, residency, which are two topics that are pretty much staying the same, uh, but we'll cover it just because it's part of the whole process of uh, voting. All right, so the new, new voter ID requirements. The uh, legislature in North Carolina passed a law that all voters moving forward will have to show a photo ID before they can vote. This law had been passed before and then they kind of reversed it and now they brought it back and are enforcing it moving forward. So starting with the municipal elections last year, voters were required to show a photo ID to be able to vote. Now that creates a whole bunch of other issues. What type of photo ID is allowed? Uh, what uh, what, what uh, uh, specifications are involved in the photo ID? So we'll talk about all those different things and what photo IDs can be shown and what photo IDs cannot be shown, essentially. So several different things because people come up with all kinds of stuff when you talk about just you know a photo ID. There's several different types of photo IDs that can be used to vote in North Carolina. We'll review the list and then talk about the requirements for each uh, photo ID. The driver's license, most common one. So if you're working, if you're an election worker, you'll notice that most people come in with a driver's license because people tend to carry that with them most of the time. So that's probably going to be the most common one that most people use. Uh, in the state of North Carolina, we, we're not uh, a huge metropolitan area where you have subways and things like that. So most people drive, so they're very likely to have a driver's license in them. The issue with the driver's license that we run into so far is a lot of people will say, well, my driver's license expired, so can I still use it? And the legislature was generous enough to say you have one year from the day it expires uh, to, to we have a year to be able to use it um, to vote, just to vote. Now, if, you, if somebody's caught uh, uh, by traffic police out there, that's a different story. We're not covering that. <laughs> to vote, you have one year with an expired license. Some people come in with, uh, they've just renewed their license, and we actually have this happen this, this uh, primary election. Just renewed their license, and they have a piece of paper that's saying it's just renewed, so they have a temporary uh, license. That cannot be used to vote. However, they can bring that in and fill out an exception form and say, my license is in the mail, it's on the way. And we found out that some of those people, their driver's license were good because they were not expired for a year. They will probably just expired for a month or a few days. So they can still use their driver's license in that case and vote the regular way instead of having to vote provisionally. Uh, with the driver's license is also the ID card. Of course, that goes along with that. People who are non operator ID, who have an ID but they don't use it for driving. Then you have a passport. Passports can be used for voting. They can be expired for more than a year as well. Passport cards, some people choose to get a passport card instead of the book. And that's, those, that's pretty much the same thing. What cannot be used is anything else that's around a passport. We had somebody call in and ask, can I use my global entry card? So people travel a lot internationally, get this global entry card, which is, looks like our ID, looks like that passport card, and it has the photo. So they say it has an expiration date, it has a photo, why can't I use it? And the simple answer is because it's not on the list. You know, the legislature did not add that to the list that we can't use it. But they can use a passport and a passport card. Uh, military IDs are one of two types of IDs that can be used with no expiration date limit. So military IDs can be used for as long as the person has it. All branches of military are covered. Veterans, veteran IDs are covered and they can continue to use them for as long as they vote without worrying about expiration dates. The other form of ID that can be used without expiration dates is a Native American tribal card. There's federal tribal cards and then there's state tribal cards. 
So any tribes recognized by the state and the federal government, and they have these cards that have their photos on them, can be used with no expiration date requirement. So those two types of IDs, military and then tribal cards, do not have an expiration date um, requirement on them. And those are the only two. Other type of ID is a student ID. So North Carolina is, uh, is known for a lot of major universities and colleges, especially the area over there I live in Raleigh, North Carolina. Within about 30 mile radius, give or take, we have 11 colleges and universities. You know, from Duke, UNC, NC State, um, St. Augustine, NC Central, they're just all in that area. So we have a lot of college students. So the question for them is, can I vote with my uh, student ID? And the answer is yes. Now with this process, the State Board of Elections has gone through a process of approving colleges and universities. Because not all their, their uh, photo IDs were usable. So it's been approved one at a time. Most of the major ones have been approved, but there are some like community colleges and some small uh, colleges that have not been approved yet. And it's strange, I was in Fayetteville uh, speaking at a uh, community college, and we looked it up, and that college I was speaking at had not been approved at that time. So, so that's interesting to, to check and see that. But uh, that's school by school as they're being approved. A lot of the major ones are, are, are good. But a student ID can be used, can't be expired for more than a year as well. State employees, everybody who works for the state, like myself and like a lot of you, um, you can use your ID and as long as it has an expiration date. So I have my state ID, but it doesn't have an expiration date. Therefore, I cannot use mine. Uh, the reason expiration dates are emphasized is because that means you're going through a continual vetting process. Somebody's actually looking to update um, your ID. So one year, expired, firefighters, um, med medical workers, people who, uh, police officers, anybody who works with the state that wants to use their employee, employee ID. All right, then we have out of state people. So people move all the time. Somebody comes from Virginia, moves to North Carolina, and they want to vote because they've lived in North Carolina for a little while. For 90 days, they can use their out-of-state ID to vote in North Carolina. However, up to the 90-day mark, then they cannot use it because they're expected to transfer over. The same requirements for that one-year uh, expiration. So if the ID is expired for more than a year, they cannot use it, even if it's out-of-state. Now, if it's expired for more than a year, a lot of times, they also have been here for more than 90 days, so both requirements will not be met. And then we come to the people over 65. So this is a little bit, uh, it's not complicated, but it's a little, it has a little twist to it. Anyone over 65 can use their ID to vote even if it's expired. However, it has to have expired before they turn 65. So it makes it a little interesting for the, the, the election officials because they have to look at that ID and say it's expired and then figure out quickly when did they turn 65 and it did expire before then. If it expired after their 65th birthday, then they're fine. Now yesterday I was in Catawba County and the, the director there told a story of a lady that came to vote and she had a driver's license and uh, she had just renewed it a year ago. And guess how old this lady was? 101. So, yeah. So, <laughs> so 101, and she just figured a driver's license, which means she's still driving. And she's going on 102. So I said, well, that blows this out of the water. Anybody was 65 and, can, and continue to renew their license. But, you know, the state has passed the law, and that's the law. So, so anybody over 65 will be able to vote with an expired driver's license. Because as people age, sometimes they stop driving, and uh, we don't want them to have to feel like they have to renew their license just to vote. Um, but I thought that was a cute story. It's, it's, it's amazing. All right, next, people who do not have IDs. So some people might say, I don't have any ID, or all my IDs are expired. 
I don't have anything that you just mentioned on that list. Then the Board of Elections will provide a voter photo ID. Voter photo ID. So this can be obtained right here. And uh, when you come to Board of Elections, you can actually obtain a voter photo ID that's for voting only. We have to emphasize that. This is not an ID that can be used to obtain other things because the, vet, the process that we're putting uh, you through is not rigorous enough for you to be able to use it for other things. It's only based on the voting process. So when you come into the uh, Board of Elections office, you can get a photo ID for free. You can get a replace for free. The requirements are simply the same way we, we process you when you're voting and ask for your name, ask for date of birth, and ask for the last four digits of your social security number. Those are the only three things asked, and then you can get your voter photo ID, and you can use it for 10 years. It's, it's good for 10 years, then it can be renewed after 10 years. Uh, the photo ID does not connect to your voter registration, because when it expires, it doesn't mean that your voter registration expires, or it doesn't mean that it holds up your voter registration. The two are uh, slightly separate. However, it allows you to vote in any election, and you're able to use that as an ID. Yes? How do you verify somebody's date of birth? Do you verify? It's based, yes. Yeah, so so what, what they do is they're basically going by your voter registration. So they act just, just oh, the same way you come in to oh, vote, and they ask you. So they do go back to the voter registration to verify those things? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's all they're going by. So to be able to do this, you have to be registered to vote. Or you can actually register to vote and get your photo oh, okay. ID. Okay, so you can't phone. walk in not registered no. and get one of these. No. no. You have to be registered. I did not know. <laughs> Good point, good point. So yeah, so no random people can just walk in and say, I want a photo ID and then give us this information. That's what I was worried about. Yes. <laughs> so we're taking that and looking at the voter roll, and if you're there, and all that matches up, then you get your photo ID. Take a picture of you and print it off in a few minutes. Uh, if you're not registered, then we go back to the registration process, which involves a couple other steps. Okay, good point. It's valid for 10 years. If it gets uh, destroyed or if it's uh, lost, you can always come back and get one for free. Uh, the Board of Elections will provide you another one for free, provide placements for free. Same process, give your name, give your uh, date of birth, and last four years social. Okay. I need, I need to emphasize this point here. You can obtain a voter photo ID at any time except the period between the end of early voting and election day. And if that makes it sound like it's a long time period, but it's only a few, a couple of days. So early voting ends on the Saturday before the election. And that's just to kind of close out that process because uh, registration, one stop voting, everything ends on that day and then we wait until election day to clear everything out. So people who do not have that photo ID, voter photo ID on election day, they have to use another form of ID or just wait until after the election to get a photo ID. Uh, if you change your name or any of the information changes and you want to update it, you can come in and get the Board of Elections to give you a replacement card. All that is free of charge again and it's good for 10 years. How does it work when voting? So photo IDs, when you're voting in person, they're simply a, a confirmation of who you are. In the past, all we asked was the name, address, you know, for you to verify that, and then compare it to the list. Now we are adding one more step where we ask for the name, your address, and we're asking for a photo ID, just to confirm that this is you. Present your, present your photo ID at the voting site, and then the election official will ask you to say your current name, and then they'll compare your name. Show uh, uh, residence at your address. They'll compare your address only to the voting role, not to the photo ID. We'll talk about that in more clarity. Uh, because photo IDs sometimes might have a different address than your current address. After they look at the photo ID, what they're trying to figure out is, is this you? 
is this U, and a key part to this is that the picture reasonably resembles you, and the name is a close enough match to the name that we have in the border row. And if all that checks out, then you receive a ballot to vote. I'll emphasize, then you receive a regular ballot to vote. If it doesn't check out, then we have another process for that. So, the same process works with curbside voting. The election official comes out to the curbside, by, by somebody's vehicle, and then they ask the same questions. The only difference is that with curbside voting, of course, there is the uh, out of affirmation. That's you saying basically that you choose to vote this way. And then photo ID will also be asked for people in their, in their vehicles. With curbside voting, the election official comes to the vehicle the exact same way, and if it checks out again, they give you a regular ballot to vote. If it doesn't check out, there is another process, whether it's uh, provisional voting, or we'll talk about the processes involved with your photo ID if the photo ID is not acceptable. So, if somebody votes by mail, they will have to present a photo ID and, and uh, put a copy of the photo ID in the ballot, the mail-in ballot. So simply make a copy of your driver's license, stick it in the, in the ballot, there's a pocket for it, and then mail it off. Uh, there are different ways, so there are people who vote online, uh, accessibility features that are, pre uh, that are provided as well. Uh, they also have a place to upload their photo ID. The only group that's exempt from this photo ID requirement is the military and people who are working overseas. So people, and diplomats and people like that who vote from overseas. They don't have to present photo IDs. If a voter does not have a photo ID or they're not able to present it in the uh, uh, vote by mail, then they can fill out a form to create an exception to the photo ID uh, requirement. Now, they will be able to say the reason why they cannot put in a copy of their photo ID. Uh, one of the main reasons for people, especially voting by mail, is they'll say, I don't have a printer. I don't have a way to print my, my photo ID, so I can't get it to you in the mail. And some of them, part of the reason they're voting absentee is because they, they can't get anywhere to you know, to go vote or to get uh, any of those services done. We'll talk about some of the exceptions and some of the reasons people use for the photo ID exception um, a little bit later. But vote by mail is handled in that manner. Let's talk about checking the photo ID. When a voter comes in to vote, the election official is looking at the photo ID to see if that photo ID qualifies the person or it resembles the person. One of the things I like to, I like to emphasize is that the election officials are not FBI agents, they're not trying to do forensics, they're not trying to look for an exact match, they're simply looking for reasonable resemblance. And in, in essence, they're looking to qualify people, as many people as possible to vote, not to exempt people or push them out of the voting process. So first thing they're looking for, is it an acceptable form? Is it a driver's license? Is it a passport? Is it, is it one of the acceptable forms of ID? Second thing they're looking for, reasonable resemblance. People's uh, uh, appearance changes. Sometimes pictures don't bring out a best sight, so the picture on there may not look like what somebody really looks like. Or things have changed over time, or it's faded. You know, the ID has faded. So they're not looking to see that it's a complete exact match, they're looking to see that it's a reasonable resemblance. Keyword there. And if they see any reasonable resemblance, you're good to go. If it's an acceptable form of ID, it's not expired, and you really have reasonable resemblance, then you're good to go. The third thing they're looking for is the name. The name has to match. Now it doesn't have to match word for word. It has to have uh, uh, similarity. An acceptable similarity or reasonable similarity to your name on the voter roll. And we'll talk about some exceptions. 
some things like driver's licenses and uh, voter roles tend to match because you kind of use go through the state to do both. Uh, however, things like student IDs. A student ID might have a name that's, that looks different because students are allowed sometimes to do nicknames, abbreviations, and sometimes people change the way they spell their names and then it kind of follows a trail in how they use that in, in different documents. So we'll talk about the, the variations that occur there. When checking the ID, the election official cannot ask for another form of ID. They're not allowed to ask for another form of ID. So I've had people complain that, well, they should have asked me for something else. Um, that's, the, that's not their job to, to ask. They're not supposed to ask for anything else. Whatever you present them is what they'll use. However, if you offer another form of ID, maybe they're looking at it and you can tell they're struggling, you say, wait, I have something else. Is this, is this allowed? Then they can use that and say, okay, you presented a different form of ID and that checked out. However, they cannot ask you for another form of ID. Uh, they can't require you to remove anything. Glasses, head covering, a hat, uh, so people will wear a mask, they can't even require you to pull down the mask. However, I always emphasize this, if you offer to pull down the mask, then they will be able to see your face a little bit better and it makes the whole process a lot easier. But they're not required to, they can't require you to do any of that. The address. The address on the ID does not have to match what's in the border roll. I'll explain that. For example, I just, I moved from my previous residence a few years ago, but then it took a while before changing my driver's license, the address of my driver's license. So if I bring in my driver's license to vote, which I just did recently, um, when I show that to them, the address of my driver's license doesn't match what's on the voter roll. The voter roll is current because where I live now. Driver's license is still my old address. They're not looking for that. They're only looking for my face and the name. So they cannot use that to disqualify a voter because the address doesn't match. And if you think about it, some of the other uh, forms of ID we're using do not have an address on them. Most of them don't have a you know, passport, or, um, student ID. Most of them do not have, even your voter ID card would not have an address on them. So that's not a part of the process. Okay, reasonably resemble. That means that the photo ID, the picture of the photo ID reasonably resembles the person signing in front of you. Now if it's completely opposite, then, then the, there's a process that's involved with that. However, most of the time they're just looking for is it a reasonable resemblance. Uh, one of the examples I use is for example, if I showed up and I had an ID and the person in it was a uh, blonde headed white guy. You know, you look at me and you say, well, this is not you. Yes, it's, it's pretty evident. So, so that's what we're talking about with reasonable resemblance. They're not looking for an exact match, they're just looking for, okay, this looks kind of like you. And we can tell that maybe, that, you know, over time, there are processes that may have caused it not to look exactly like you. So some of the things that they cannot take into account are changes in weight. My driver's license right now has a picture from, I can't remember when, so I was a lot skinnier then. So I look, you know, <laughs> there's a change in my face. Um, my hair apparently has remained a little bit relatively the same, it's starting to gray out, but, but some people will have gray hair, some people will have darker hair, some people will have no hair. You know, they probably chose to go bald. Some people will have more hair than they had in, in their ID. Some people will wear a wig. Some people will have a hairline that's receding. You know, so you know, all kinds of things might happen over time and we're not looking for that, we're looking for that reasonable resemblance. Uh, changes in complexion, some people have skin diseases that cause their complexion to change. And so they may look very different from what you see in the picture. Um, cosmetics, piercings, tattoos, um, then things like glasses and um, um, contact lenses, somebody who's wearing contact lenses in the picture, but then now they wear glasses. Again, in my picture, I didn't have glasses on, now I wear glasses permanently. So those are not things they're looking for, they're looking for the reasonable resemblance. And then the biggest one is effects from aging. That just, that's just natural. And to um, take a picture now, two years, five years from now, you're gonna look different from that picture. 
And then medical conditions or treatments are also common effects. The name. The name has to be similar. We can say reasonably similar to what you see in the voter roll. So we're not looking to exclude people based on things like this. Um, the name on the voter roll says Mary Beth Smith. The ID says Beth Smith. That's equivalent. That's very common on uh, college student IDs especially. Some people will have that on their employment IDs because that's the name they go by. Junior included versus junior removed. So uh, for example, I have a nephew who's his dad's name, Junior. And he started removing the junior when he went to college because he just wanted to be the full name. So in some of his IDs, he might have the name without the junior. But then some of the official documents might have the full name with the JR at the, at the end. So that's sort of calls for disqualification. Bill versus William. I still don't know how to get Bill from William, but we all know that <laughs> Bill is William, right? So somebody must have, might have that, and you'll say, okay, Bill is William. Uh, Sue, Suzanne, and then you have the uh, initials, A.B. Sanchez versus Aaron B. Sanchez. And you can tell, okay, A.B. Sanchez stands for Aaron B. Sanchez. So some of those things are not reasons for disqualification of an ID. Former names, maiden names, we get this question a lot. What if my ID has my maiden name and the voter roll has my married name or vice versa? Again, they're looking for reasonable equivalence. Uh, when, when, that, when that happens, there may be processes involved to get that changed or that, get that fixed or verified, but that's not a reason to disqualify somebody from voting or using that photo ID to vote. Hyphenation, common one. Some people hyphenate their names. The hyphen might be missing in other documents and present in others. Apostrophes, you know, mark at the top. Um, those accents that are used in some names, and in some places you, 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 there's no way of typing that into the into the the ID. So if it's missing, it's not a big deal. The order of the names: Maria Eva Garcia Lopez versus Maria E. Lopez Garcia. It's the same process, just the order of names is different. And then spelling variations: Dennis with two ends, or Dennis with one end. We have Susan, Suzanne, with the double N E. So some people spell the names differently. My 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 one of my uh, daughters is named Deborah, but people when they write her cards and stuff, sometimes they spell Deborah, you know, D E B O R A H, and <laughs> she's like, no, it's Deborah, D E B O R A. So variations like that are not that big a deal. You can tell that it's reasonably equivalent to the name that you're looking for. All right. So the election official looks at the ID and they say, like I said, they look at this picture and they're like, ah, this, this is not you. This person is blonde haired white guy. You're dark haired black guy. So <laughs> it's not you. And I insist it's me. I'm just using extremes. What they'll do, if they look at it and they say that, they'll enter a challenge. They'll say there's a challenge and they'll send me to a help station. So every election a uh, facility like this one here will have a help station where they can send people to and that help station will involve judges, a panel of judges. Every precinct should have a, a panel of three judges, one who's a chief judge and then two others. Those three people will begin to look at that ID. If all three of them agree that it's not me, then I cannot use that ID to vote. So it takes four different people agreeing that this ID is not useful. We can't use it for voting purposes. Um, once they determine that, then I still get to vote, but I vote provisionally while they investigate that ID. Or I can get a chance to say, uh, I'll bring in another form of ID. Or I can fill out an exception form to say I don't have any other form of ID. So I still have options, uh, ways to be able to, to vote. But however, this three judge panel is not like a, a panel in a court of law. In a court of law is about majority that, that rules. In this case, if only one of those judges 
decides that there is a reasonable resemblance and this ID is good, then I get to vote the regular way. So it takes only one out of the four people looking at this ID to determine that this is valid and it's allowed to be used. One out of four. If I'm not uh, approved with the ID that I'm trying to use, then I get a provisional ballot. Provisional ballot allows you to still vote. However, it's set aside for further investigation. There are many reasons provisional ballots have been used before, um, and one of them now is going to be with photo IDs as well. The person gets to vote, and then the Board of Elections will do the investigation, or they can come back around and say, uh, the person can come back within the 10 days after the election to bring another form of ID so the vote can count. So the two ways that you can vote provisionally, um, if, if uh, your photo ID is not acceptable, one person can bring the photo ID, an acceptable form of ID, or they can fill out a photo ID exception form. Here I want to emphasize that statement truthfully. Truthfully complete a photo ID exception form. So going back to the example of me with my ID that doesn't look like me at all, if I go come back and fill out the exception form and say something like, um, I have changed over time. That's, it. That's the reason why that photo ID looks like that. Then the Board of Elections has to start thinking through that and, and determine, is this a truthful statement? And is this the reason why I can't have, uh, I don't have a valid form of ID? So that's the determination they made for my board to come. However, if the board of election comes back and says the you filled this out, uh, this exception form out, but the reason you gave is not a compelling reason for why you would not be able to get a photo ID, then the vote will not be counted. So truthfully simply means that it's a truthful reason, we'll talk about some of the exceptions in a moment, that makes sense, essentially. We're all human, so people can understand circumstances and situations. So we'll talk about some of these things that, uh, that are allowed under provisional ballots. So provisional ballots are fail-safe, but they've been used over time for many different things. Uh, it's offered to voters when there are questions about their qualification to vote, so say somebody comes in and they say, I'm supposed to be registered, but we don't have the information. Then they vote provisionally, and then the Board of Elections goes and investigates if they're actually registered. Somebody comes in and says, uh, I'm supposed to vote for the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or the Libertarian Party in this election. And we don't have that information. Um, in our system, they vote provisionally, then the Board of Elections does the research. Somebody says uh, they want a specific ballot style. Um, this primary election, we had all kinds of calls, people wanting to vote on all three. And say, so, why can I vote for one person here, one person there, one person there? So we had to explain, this is how primary election works. It's the purpose of the primary. In the general election, you get to vote for anybody you want. Uh, but we got, most of the calls we got that day was about people wanting to vote for whoever they want and not understanding how the process works. But if somebody says I registered this party, but you're giving me a ballot for, they told me I could only vote for this party. I actually had a call about that. Somebody registered, the husband registered the correct party, but the wife somehow was registered as a libertarian. So it's, I would pull it up and it says lib. And she said, well, they made me vote for this. They made me, are they supposed to make me? I said, they, they can't make you do anything. However, your registration says this, so they have to give you that ballot. They, they, they can't give you any other ballot. Uh, the only other option she had was to vote provisionally, and then the Board of Elections can go back and research. However, the research would have ended up in the same place. We registered that way. So the answer to, to that person was, go back and change your voter registration, and you can either do an affiliated or choose another party that you want. So now, Voter ID has been added to provisional ballots. People who do not have a voter ID or valid form of ID can also vote provisionally. So let's talk about how this works. 
if uh, they can't pre present an acceptable form of ID. The ballot is counted, and I've said this, this a couple times before, so, so we'll just uh, rush through it real quick. They can either bring a photo ID or fill out an exception form. But they have to do it on the last business, uh, by, before the end of the last business day, uh, before Canvas. Can, this is about 10 days after the election. One of the things uh, that's easier to do, say if your ID is expired and you have a piece of paper for a renewal, is simply just fill out an exception form right there. While, while the person is voting, you know, provided, vote provisionally, fill out the exception form, then my ID is in the mails on the way, and this is why I don't have it here. And then you're done, instead of having to come back and present a for ID. So, impediments. Reasons that people use in that exception form. Number one, lack of transportation. That's probably got a common one. If somebody is in the hospital, somebody's in a hospice, somebody's in a nursing home, or somebody's just at home and they don't have a vehicle, they don't have a way to get anywhere. Like I say, North Carolina is a vast state and it's a state where you require uh, uh, vehicles. We don't have subway systems, even in Raleigh, you need a car to get around. So people will give that reason and say, I just haven't had a way to get anywhere to get an ID or get it renewed. Um, that's a valid reason. There's also disability or illness. There are people who are in the hospital, people who are disabled, and they just can't get anywhere. That's a valid reason for an exception. Uh, lack of birth certificate or any other underlying documents. Some people have no starting point. That's a rare one, and I haven't run into any county that has had that situation. Um, maybe one or two here and there. But there are people say who are in foster homes, and maybe their parents never, never gave them those documents. Maybe they were lost. So they just never, they've never had an ID. And therefore, they don't know where to start. And they can say that's the exception. But they're able to still register to vote um, as a US citizen. Walk to school schedule. Some people are just busy. Walk school, walk school. I used to be in that situation when I was, I was a student. Walk school, walk school. I'd be going from school, up at six in the morning, back home at midnight, and Monday through Friday. And then you only have weekends. So that is reasonable because then I don't have time to actually go get something we need or get something figured out. And then you have family responsibilities. I have kids, young kids, I have to pick up my kids, I have to do daycares and kids' activities. It's just life is just moving so fast and you don't have a way to get things renewed or get uh, the ID. So a lot of those are reasonable impediments. So, so if just the uh, election runs up on you. Like this past election, I just, I, I realized two days before that I was going to be working election day all day pretty much, so I won't be able to vote. I was like, I gotta vote early. And the only day I had to vote was Saturday, so I went in on Saturday at 2.30 p.m. And I got to vote. <laughs> so I'm one of those last minute people show up. <laughs> But it really just hit me, I think, on that Thursday or Friday. I was like, I won't be able to vote if I don't do it this Saturday. You know, working Monday through Friday, and then election day, I was going to be working all day. So, so situations like that. But we're not talking about just uh, negligence and not taking care of stuff. One of the biggest reasons, the uh, most valid uh, reasonable impediment, is loss to stolen IDs. So if somebody lost their wallet, lost their ID, that's, that's valid, that happens. Uh, the documents were stolen, they were raw, you know, all kinds of things happened. They applied for but not received, I've talked about this several times, uh, we've run into this a few times, I applied for it, it's in the mail, however most of those people, you can still ask them to show the ID, if it's not expired for a year, they should still be able to use it. Uh, other reasons to be described by the voter, now the best way our general counsel say this is, uh, <laughs> Other reason doesn't mean just any reason. If somebody says the sky is blue, that's why I didn't I didn't bring my photo ID. Um, the sky being blue doesn't prevent them from get having a photo ID. So even though the statement is truthful, it doesn't mean that it's an impediment from this situation. So people will give all kinds of reasons, but it's up to the board of election to look through it and say, okay, this is reasonable, this is not. All right, other exceptions to presenting a photo ID. 
religious objections to being photographed. Uh, we know this will come up because we have some religious sects that do not take pictures, they don't believe in technology. The Amish are the only, the, the main one I can think of. So if somebody comes in and says we don't take photos, they're still allowed to vote, but they can fill out an exception form and uh, for religious reasons. Natural disasters, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, destroy the whole neighborhood. Uh, this will be well known, so it's not hard to prove. We can go online and look up, did the governor declare a natural disaster in this area? They're only declared by the governor or the president. So those are, those are easy and clear to follow through. Um, the key point to make is people will never be turned away from voting because of a lack of a photo ID. They will always have a fail safe of voting provisionally and given a chance to show it and provide it or fill out that exception form truthfully so that their vote can count. Okay, so the last two parts of this are voter registration and residency. Uh, I'm going to uh, brush through this fairly quickly because these are common topics that we talk about fairly regularly. The main ones I wanted to cover is the photo ID laws and how that connects to provisional voting because there's a new element to this. So registering to vote, the voter registration remains the same. People can register to vote um, if they're qualified to vote and they can register in several different places. So let's talk about the qualifications first. The voter registration uh, application can be completed online or it can be completed at a place like this or several different places that we'll talk about. But the number one qualification obviously is still that there must be a US citizen. It must be a US citizen and then they must live in the county of their registration and be there for at least 30 days before the election. So this, this second one is what confuses a lot of people. So on election day we'll get calls from people saying, I went to vote and they told me I was going to uh, register there. Did you move? Yes, I did. When did you move? Uh, about a year ago. So they moved, but their registration was not updated. So when they go to the county where they want to vote, they, they find that um, their, the name is not on the list because the list were purged and they moved to a different county. So then some people had to drive to another county to go vote. And when they went there, sure enough, they found that the name was there. So it has to be the county. North Carolina is based on counties, and you have to be registered in that county. And be there for the 30 days. Must be 18 years old on the day of elections. However, 17 year olds can register and vote in a primary if they're turning 18 by election day. People must not be serving a sentence for felony conviction. So felons cannot vote, but people with misdemeanors can vote. Again, we run into this confusion every now and then. Uh, why is this person allowed to vote and I'm not? And we both went to serve time in prison. Um, the difference is one might have a felony, one might have a misdemeanor. The only person who can clear them of the misdemeanor is the probation officer. The Board of Elections has nothing to do with that. So voting rights are one of the rights that are taken away for committing a felony. 17-year-olds, they can register and vote in a primary if they're turning 18 before the election. So this year is November 5th. If somebody's turning 18 before November 15th, they can actually register and vote in the primary this year. Now, of course, it's already passed, but they can still register and vote um, in November if they're turning 18 before November 5th. Future voters, uh, these are people who are 16 and up. Future voters can pre-register. So this helps with catching voters as they get their driver's licenses. A lot of young kids get their driver's licenses at 16, 15, 16. So when they go to the DMV, they'll be asked, do you want to register to vote? They can pre-register. Then their registration will be held by the Board of Elections. When they turn 18, it'll become active. And they can go ahead and start voting. But that helps kind of capture voters early. Registration for voting can be done in uh, various places. Our website has a lot of resources and uh, places you can register. Uh, but we do have an office building in Raleigh. You can show up there and register to vote. We don't get a lot of people coming directly to our office, but, but it's, uh, you can register to vote. County Board of Elections, like this right here, 
You can go to a public library and then public institutions like high schools and universities and colleges. All those are places to register to vote. Private colleges and universities also do hold uh, registration drives, or registration drives. And sometimes what happens is with this registrations, they don't get pulled into the system, so sometimes their names are missing, but somebody can vote provisionally and get that. Um, the voter registration still be valid. Uh, additionally, voter registration services are also provided at uh, DMV. DMV is a common one. Social services, public health, and places like disability services agencies. They provide services for that as well. Okay, and uh, this is just additional uh, places where you can get the same services. Voter registration ends 25 days before the election. There's an exception to that. During early voting, you do get a chance to register. It's called one-stop voting. So during early voting, about 17 days of early voting, people can register and vote at the same time. But official day to register to vote is 25 days before the election. And that's the one-stop voting, or early voting, where you can register and vote on the same day. Again, this ends on the Saturday before the election. Uh, we're going to look at uh, what's required to register to vote, a photo ID, and something to prove residence. So the key here is that these are the requirements for registration to vote, but this document you see on the right cannot be used for uh, as, as photo ID because they of course they don't have a photo. This is only proof for residents. But for somebody who registered to vote, say for example a student, they can use their student photo ID and some type of mail that came to them there. When people are updating their registration, we got a lot of calls about this, um, this election. How do I change my party affiliation? How do I change my name on the voter registration? So all that can be updated on using our website, but there's a form here that pulls up, and then you can go in and make the changes. Name changes happen a lot. People get married or changing names for whatever reason. Uh, you do have address changes, which are the most common, because people move all, constantly move all the time. So you want to make that address change and update that. And then people will also go in to change their party affiliation. So we get that a lot. So the lady that I talked to that day that was registered libertarian by the state, could simply go in and make that change to whatever party she wants or put in an affiliated. And then she could get to choose which party to vote for the primary. So a lot of that can be done on our website and DMV gives a very efficient way of doing this as well, updating voter registrations. Military and overseas um, voters, they have their own system where they can request a mail-in absentee ballot the same way as registered voters or they can apply to register and vote through special programs for military and overseas voters. Uh, they do have a portal that's opened up for them, uh, fvap.gov, where they can actually do the absentee ballots. However, all voters in North Carolina can request an absentee ballot. I know this came up quite a bit in 2020. Uh, some states just send absentee ballots to everybody. North Carolina does not do that. In North Carolina, you have to request it. If you request it, you will get it. And then you can decide, choose to use it or not. If you get the absentee ballot and then choose to go in and vote in person, then you need to discard the absentee ballot. Uh, avoid trying to send both because um, that, of course, will be caught in the system. Finally, residency. So residency is simply the place where you live, the place where you sleep every night. And that's, uh, that's the best definition, easiest definition. Uh, you have to have some type of physical address where your mail goes to, to be able to register to vote and use that for voting purposes. So the voter has to use their fixed residence. There are people who move co constantly. Uh, if you move permanently from apartment to apartment, that's your residence, and you have to make that update. 
However, if you temporarily locate to another state for work, like you have traveling nurses who do that, you have people who, like doctors who do different things, construction workers, then you can choose that you want to vote in that different area. You temporarily locate, you can still vote in the place where you moved to or the place where you came from. You just have to decide where your residence is and if you have an address there. Um, if you move temporarily, but you know that you're, you, want, you want to use uh, that new address, and, but you're trying to vote in the previous place, then that will not essentially work. If you move to make a new place your home, you cannot use your previous address to go back and vote there. So temporary location is allowed. Moving permanently and then trying to vote in place where you move from is not allowed. Let's look at uh, non-traditional residency. So non-traditional residency involves people who live in, say, motorhomes or RVs. Um, you have people who may be homeless for whatever reason and they're still trying to get their voter registration marked out. For these types of people, they have to have some type of address where the mail comes, comes to. So for example, somebody who lives in an RV park can use the address for that RV park. A lot of RV parks will have an address for them to use. Where does your mail go to? People who are homeless can, could use a uh, um, shelter where they're kind of registered to get their mail. And that can be used as the place of their permanent address. Several different options being provided here. College students can choose to vote here, where they go to college, or they can choose to vote at home, where they come from. They can vote absentee, or they can drive back home on election day and vote, or they can register where they are to vote. The caution for college students is that just don't try to be registered in both places. In North Carolina, the system will catch it and remove the duplicates. However, if you do that in different states, then you may be registered in two places, and if you try to vote in two places, then you're in real trouble. Uh, then you'll have a felony and not be able to vote at all. We encourage people to get involved. Get involved as election officials. I'm sure the Board of Elections will appreciate that. Uh, get involved as student election assistants. Young people, 17-year-olds and 18-year-olds who are still in school, can actually get involved and be part of the election process. And then multi-partisan assistant teams. These are team members who actually go out and help people vote. People who are in nursing homes and hospitals. People who cannot, don't have mobility issues and they can't actually get to the voting place. Uh, they're multi-partisan assistant uh, teams who operate in a non-partisan manner. But you're just simply helping people with the voting process. Get involved and help us out to get the electoral process be more efficient but also secure and have a high level of integrity. That's all I have. Thank you.